Hello, hello, everyone. I'm a little nervous to, st to start talking right now because I feel like I'm going to, to sneeze. I can feel it, like, in the back of my nose. It's coming. I don't know if it's going to happen, though. It's going gonna, it's gonna to whisk away. It's going to be stale, stolen away by the, by the sneeze goblins. Okay, okay, okay. I'm all good. I'm all good. <laughs> hello, Sarah Fontanets. Welcome in, welcome in. And hello, mo 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 and that's not even his full name but uh welcome in mr mr squid man or t uh, octopus man i should say mm, mm. it was like it was like right at the back i could feel it coming but um it, it wasn't so close that it was like it was definitely gonna come through and then it just disappears because those are the worst it's kind of like it's kind of like you build up to that to that expectation that that release and you don't get it it sucks but uh, you know, at least at least I didn't like sneeze all over you guys. That would be a little icky, just a tiny bit icky. But I hope everyone's doing doing well. It's Monday, the start of the week. Uh, I did <laughs> my my sleep was not the best this uh, last night. I kind of stayed up a little bit a little bit late, and uh, I paid for it the next morning. But I got a croissant and some tea, and I was happy then. I was a happy little camper. Uh, and then I just threw on some headphones and uh, went about my day. Oh no, I put in some headphones and threw on some music and went about my day. Hello, Haru. Hello, hello, hello. What? Where's my water bottle? Hang on. Drown check. Thank you very much, Haru. And welcome in as well, copyright. Bara bing, bara boom. Bara, I don't think I don't think I'm big enough to be a bara. I think uh, I think I have to be at least at least like fifty pa more pounds of muscle, fifty pounds heavier with of muscle. And maybe a little bit more fat, because that's kind of what, what people seem to like with their bears. <laughs> uh, there's some, there's, there is some really great, really great a bear. Yeah, like um, what, what did I come into? No, I just because copyright said bear, and it made me think of of uh, the anime term for a bear. Uh, there's some, there's some good, like you know, kind of jacked jacked designs out there there's one that's like he really just seems like like a father who just wants to grill he just has like a big beard and um he's fairly popular i think he's like he, he's like really embraced like the dad or uncle vtuber kind of style i don't mean it like that I, I know you didn't i know you didn't that was just that was just what i what popped into my mind uh it was it was kind of weird today in the gym um there was a there was a woman going about her her thing and that's not weird that's not weird to see women in the gym uh but she was just in a bra just just working out in a bra and it was sort of like i mean i mean, I mean <laughs> it was distracting um on two levels one on the obvious point but also on on the higher point it was sort of just like why is she just in a bar and why yeah 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 yes yes she was in pants she was in in pants i feel like if she was not in pants i would be i would be you know also pointing that out i thought you know i thought the fact that i was focusing on the on the just bra part. <laughs> i thought that was sort of like yeah, I, 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 I see why why people would have assumed because I said just that, but I, I meant like, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. I'm focusing on the on the upper area. Uh, she she was wearing pants, uh, thankfully, because it was it was mightily distracting, um, and it wasn't like 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 the thing was is that it wasn't like a sports bra because like you you I often see if there are girls in the gym, some of them will be in in that type of clothing, and that's normal gym wear it was it just looked like a normal bra and i was like why <laughs> why it would be like a guy like to me 
working out in other than sports bras. Hell yeah, I'm, I imagine, I imagine so. I, I do not have the the things like like that's that's the thing that confused me is I assume I assume that's like the common thing. Girl got no time to change. I suppose maybe maybe she forgot hers. But even still, like I I still expect like if you're gonna be wearing like just a bra, uh, you'd expect like maybe like a top or something like a crop top. It just like it was just odd. It, it reminded me like if a guy was working out shirtless. It, it kind of had that same feel. I was like, I, okay, I. All right, you know what? Fair enough. Just wipe down, wipe down the stuff after you're done, please. Did she see you staring? I wasn't. I wasn't staring. I wasn't staring. It was like a glance here and there, being like, "Okay, please, like, just get out of my peripheral vision." <laughs> um, but no, it was it was something unique. I remember. I remember before I saw a guy come in in um, in like dress shoes dress shoes and like a suit pants into the gym before and he just started like badly doing pull-ups and like he did not know what he was doing <laughs> it was like he came to the gym with, with an idea of what the gym was like and just tried to do things that i was constantly i even said it to um I wanted to to say say to the no I did say to the people the the people at the desk like this guy is going to hurt himself if he keeps doing what he's doing and they they had a talk with him and I remember, I remember I saw him he came in with like more normal clothing <laughs> and um seemed to slowly get onto the right track I didn't see him anymore after a, a couple of weeks but I hope he I be kept kept with it <sighs> I never want to turn anyone off the gym. It's like it's just seeing what certain people kind of do their first couple of times to the gym, or like what they, you know, just randomly decide to do, it can be can be interesting. And then you see those those guys and girls who are just absolute units who can throw weight around like it's nothing. Bro, staring at a boy. <laughs> hey. Look, if they're on display, I'm just saying, I'm probably gonna glance. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like that's, that's not terrible. You wanted to check, but you don't want to stare. Yeah, I mean, you never, no, 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 I didn't even, I didn't even want to check her out, because it was sort of like, it was sort of like, it was, it was purely confusion at seeing someone so not dressed in the gym like I, I even find it I even find it kind of like you know those top uh, tank tops that some guys will have where they're really loose and the cut like it's like the tank top hole at the side there's about an inch of fabric <laughs> like an inch of fabric at the bottom and the rest of it is just a massive hole it it's not re it's more of a vest it's not a top in, in any fashion. So you can see, like, if they lean forward slightly, you can see right through everything. Um, and sure, you can, you can mire, you can mire, uh, well, well-built individuals. But at the same time, it's like, oh my god, please, just, like, <laughs> that's way too much skin. You're gonna, like, get sweat everywhere. And yeah, people sweat in the gym, but it's like, you know, if your if your bare skin is touching things, it's a little bit a little bit worse. A little bit worse. And then and then you go to work out on an on a, on a thing and there's all sweat on it and you have to go clean it. Cause they should have cleaned it themselves. A huge act. Uh I can you not see my, my muscles underneath underneath my uh my thing? I have like prominent collarbones. I, I I will be I will be quite jacked in my in my next design. Um, I would say I'm, I'm decently, decently built. Uh, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, um, cause I'm still dealing with a bit of issues around my thing. I can't work as hard as I can. Um, but I am, I am, I'm decently quite, quite decently sized. I'm often, um, m my friends often joke about me, uh, kind of being like the strong one. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not. I'm not like super, super strong or anything. I'm. I'm a gym rat, but I'm not like a a super gym rat. Uh, I kind of. I kind of wish I would have. Uh, would have started like wrestling or, or uh, like Olympic weightlifting, because th those guys. Those guys are huge. Or even like you know those guys who do gymnastics. My boss is a gym rat. All of a sudden, yeah. Uh, oh, is this um? Hmm. Oh no no no. no. Uh, did he just get super into it recently? And it's like, it, it, did it become his whole personality? Is he going around in like, in like uh, short shorts, short running shorts, and uh, he carries his water bottle everywhere, as I do. But it's like, it's like a, it's like a runner's water bottle. A super gym rat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are the guys who literally live twenty four seven. Your brother is like that. <laughs> They have all the supplements, all the protein powders, and the the uh, the creatine, and maybe some of them have a little bit extra on the side. Uh, what are we doing? What are we doing today on the stream? Uh, today we're gonna be we're gonna be doing a little bit of reading in a little while. Um, maybe in in about I'd say five ten minutes, I'll uh, I'll be continue our little reading on Philip of Macedon. Uh, I think today is actually quite a short chapter. If I. Uh, if I double check, I think it's only like, yeah, it is. Hmm. hmm. Oh, there's a photo. Okay. I'm glad I checked because I realized there is a there's a map, and if you guys know one thing that I love is being able to show you guys maps while I while I read and having it up because then I feel. And I feel like it's making it easier for you guys to understand. Have your uh, have your Mondays been been decent to do? For those of you who are still going through it or are, are at the end of it, um, it's it's actually going to be quite nice uh, soon enough for me. Uh, coming up, there's a couple of bank holidays in the next in the next two weeks. I think I'm going to have essentially three short weeks uh like what like four day weeks in a row it's gonna be so so nice i had like two hours of sleep oh haru haru no i had i had poor sleep as well but i i got at least more than two hours why were you up so late why were you up so late? I have no holidays. Oh no! Oh no! See, we we have St. Patrick's Day, and we have uh, Easter. The Easter, Easter. So we have uh, good. We have Good Friday as a bank holiday. We have St. Patrick's Day, which falls on a Sunday, but we're gonna have the Monday off. And then I think our. I think we're taking like a. We're all taking the Monday of the, of Easter week, Easter weekend off. But Haru, oh no, that sucks. When's your when is your holidays? Because I know that's like that's the thing that keeps me going. Is thinking, okay, look, I'm getting a day off here. I'm getting I'm getting this there. It will be it will be interesting though because I will have the uh, uh, next month. I have a week off. Ooh, lovely, lovely, lovely. A whole week, hopefully. I I do hope I hope that comes to fruition. A week off is very nice. Although they go so quick, don't they? Like, weekends go fast. But I'm so, I'm so used to weekends flying by. But even a week off, it seems so long. But it's like... It's like you blink and suddenly it's Sunday. Or the next week. And it's like, wait. I work again? But uh, make sure you... Make sure you do enjoy it. I hope... Do you have any... Do you have any plans for it? Are you going anywhere? Are you going to do anything? Or are you just going to... Are you just gonna fall in bed and get and catch up on all your lost sleep? If you were to catch up on all your lost sleep, it would probably be the week, like two weeks, two weeks before you uh you go back to work. <laughs> They'd be wondering where you are for a full week. I just want to rot in your bed and draw. <laughs> do you do you draw in your bed, Haru? Do you are you like I'm picturing I'm picturing you like with your like. Um, I iPad or like draw pad. Um, on your bed, you're like lying on your stomach and you're drawing, and your feet are like in the air, like kicking back and forth. If you get what I mean. 
<laughs> uh, let me pull up my drive so I can get my map. And no worries, copyright. Sometimes. <laughs> real, real girly drawn hours. You're a shrimp even in Ben Haru. No, please, please fix your spine. Hang on. I will redeem. I have infinite points. I don't have an un unshrimp emote or redeem. Oh, no. Do I have an emote? I don't. It's so over. Already broke your spine. <laughs> ah, yes. His, his glow stick spine breaking. We got we love we love Haru or we love Sasa for that. I haven't been able to catch some of his streams recently. I have to I'll have to come in. I have quite a few points build up actually on him. I'm gonna have to fly in there and uh You were the start of that spine breaking trend, oh my god, trendsetter, trendsetter. Literally literally giving him content. She's so good. Oh, I forgot to do something. Let me just do this. Oh, I... Hang on. There we go. Okay. But uh, I, I'm going to have to fly into one of his streams and uh, redeem the angel, the angel Sasa. Little, little cute Sasa. I lo <laughs> I feel like if you can get like five people to do that in a row, it breaks him. It, it's like his mind is destroyed by, by having such a cute and adorable image on screen rather than his dark and uh, menacing persona. That can also ta turn very, very dumb in two seconds. I remember doing it multiple times. Mm -hmm. I've been a part of a few, uh, a few uh, bully streams together with with you and Kwai and some others. Just, just forcing him, forcing him to be an angel. I'll have to get you guys something like that from me. But I have no idea what it would be. Hmm. I have enough points. Okay. Next time there's a Sasa redeem. Cat. I, ah, no. 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 Wait. Didn't, didn't someone draw me as a cat boy before? <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm still going through puberty. Mm. Ah, my voice croaked. Oh. <clears throat> no. <laughs> um, I think someone... Did someone draw me as a cat boy before? I swear they did. Justin Bieber voice crack. <laughs> baby, 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 oh. Baby, 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 oh. That's all I can remember. That's the only song of his I remember. It's the It's the one no one liked. Everyone hated it. It was so weird thinking back that like there's this random there's this random like like female oriented singer and and fucking people hated him. I guess it's just like it's just like level of popularity and and fame. It's like this random guy is just thrown onto everywhere. He was everywhere and people immediately turn against him. Um out of, out of like a form of both resentment and just annoyance out of how how prevalent he is. When are you doing karaoke again? I actually wouldn't mind doing it soon. I might do it. I will have my house free for a couple of days, for about a week's time. How many points do we need for full Justin B for karaoke? I, I do not know a single song of his I couldn't I those would not go well in any fashion um I'm that that is at least at least a million a million <laughs> rua bucks I'm sorry 
36. Oh no. You guys can, you guys, <laughs> do you guys want a loan? I can give you a loan. You'll have to pay it back though. You'll have to pay it back by becoming my permanent viewers. You'll have to always be here. <laughs> ah. But, um, what's the interest rate? At least, it, it's a floating interest rate. <laughs> yes, sorry, Haru. Now you're go. I, I've cut your pay, and now I'm, I'm now I'm gonna force you to take out a loan. Uh, with me as the lender. And there's also gonna be an overdraft facility. You're, yeah. <laughs> Why am I controlling all of your finances? <laughs> But you 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 you're getting you're getting ways to to recoup your losses from what I've heard. Your boss is gonna be the dead of you. Oh, no, Haru. Well, you you know what you know maybe maybe I should treat you a little better. I don't want I don't want my maid to die, because if she dies, then who's gonna who's gonna clean up? Who's gonna clean up? It's gonna be it's gonna turn into a pig's die. It's it's gonna be a disaster. The place won't be clean. It'll be terrible. But welcome in, last a lot. I forgot to say thank you very much for joining us as always. Ugh. Let me. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to get into or or tonight's reading. Um, I'm going to see if I can finish this chapter in about an hour's time. I might be able to. I'd say not an hour, um, but I'm probably only going to stream for, for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. A half. My boss will turn into a DC cat boy without me, guys, for real. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> You're going to kill me. Ugh. I'm not going to turn into a Discord cat boy because my, my okay, you know what? You know what? Maybe just in case, just in case uh Haru you you can get a little bonus, okay? You can get a little bonus. We we'll have to discuss what your bonus will be. Uh it's not going to be significant, but you can get you can get a little raise, okay? A little raise. A slight one, like 2 bucks. You know what? You you know what? You know what? You know what your bonus is gonna be. What? Whatever change you can find cleaning up, uh, like in the in the like crevices of the couch or something, or the logs, I guess that's what you can keep. <laughs> you can keep like five cents that you find. <laughs> it sounds like something that they do in America, where it's like that's your way of tipping your 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 uh, maids. Push-ups. I was just about to read. Okay. Hang on. Let me get this off. I'm just going to do a short couple of push-ups because I do want to uh, get through with reading soon. So I will not be accepting any more uh, push-up redeems from this point on. For this stream, anyway. Ugh. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty. For all you guys know, I could just be counting. I can, I could be just sitting at my desk, counting. Nah, I wouldn't do that. I promise, I'm 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 giving you some some money's worth. You got twenty five for a thousand. That's pretty good, I think.
Okay. Now, we begin our reading. So, Chapter 7, Warrior Diplomat. When we last left off, uh, Philip had just taken the, the Thermopylae Pass. And I'm very interested to see... And he had done so without spilling a single drop of blood. In a wild turn of events, the Phokian general, who had been betrayed by other Phokians in internal power conflicts, and then retook his position as kind of the head general, acquiesced and joined Philip's side, and denied Athenians and Spartans and other groups who wanted to defend the Thermopylae Pass as a kind of holding point against Philip, which they certainly would have been able to, instead turned away their help and welcomed Philip with open arms into the three cities. And he had done it in such a way that he had been able to bring his entire army through. So let's see what Philip is about to do now that he has all of southern Greece open before him. Philip's seizure of the Thermopylae Pass was, a, was more a victory of diplomacy and intelligence than of arms. As in most successful diplomatic affair efforts, the threat of force played an important part of Philip's calculations, and it was no accident that Philip arrived at Thermopylae prepared to fight a pitched battle. But it was Philip's diplomatic skills that convinced Phalicus to deliver the pass without Philip having to fire a shot, the latest gamble in a decade-long political game that Philip played exquisitely to his advantage. The major Greek states were kept at each other's throats while Philip furthered his own national ambitions, first in Thrace, Amphipolis and Thessaly, and then in Thrace again. In those instances when Philip might have intervened to end the war or lessen its burden on his own allies, he did nothing. Philip wanted the sacred war to continue, and continue it did, and continue it did. Macedonia's emergence as a major power was possible in large part because the most important Greek states were busy fighting each other at the centre of the Greek world, while Philip expanded Macedonian power at its periphery. Isocrates' obser observation that Greece, quote, was filled and obsessed with war and revolutions and massacres and innumerable evils, did not escape Philip's notice, and he manipulated these circumstances to his advantage with great skill. When Philip was ready to strike at the center of Greece, no state or combination of states was left that could stop him. Philip's ability to use force successfully in conjunction with diplomacy marks him as, the, as one of the great warrior diplomats of the ancient world. Philip and the Macedonian army were now less than 30 miles from Alatea, with no substantial enemy forces between them and the Phocian capital. To the southeast, Thebes and the armies of the Boethian League were preparing to move north with the dual mission of crushing Phocis and positioning the Theban army across Philip's line of march to prevent his further advance into central Greece. So you can see, even though Philip was technically allied with these two uh, as part of the Amphiphictonic Council in the Sacred War, and they're, they're a little scared and they're going to try and do it in such a way that they'll force Philip. <sighs> Excuse me. And they will force Philip to uh, to come to terms, or at least not try anything too funny. Focus's ally, Athens, had already signed a peace with Philip, and Sparta had withdrawn its troops at Phalicus's order. Focus was now trapped in a vice by two major, pow ar major armies without any prospect of aid. The Phocians, their new hope now completely shattered, surrendered to Philip in June 346 BC. The Amphictyonic Peace The Macedonian army quickly occupied the fortress towns guarding Thermopylae and sent armed contingents to other Phocian towns as a show of force. Philip was well aware that Thebes and Thessaly wished to impose great suffering on Phocus, and his quick occupation of the country's key cities 
and towns was designed as much to protect the Phokians from Theban vengeance as to demonstrate the Macedonians' army, army's control of the country. But for all the military force at his disposal, Philip was by no means a free agent in determining Phokus' fate. Thebes, Thessaly, the Boeotian League, States, and Athens all had important interests in what happened to Phocus and were determined to press, thing, press them on Philip. Having fought the sacred war and as a leader of a religious coalition, Philip could hardly abandon that role and impose his own peace without taking the risk of shattering the alliance and frightening the rest of Greece into a grand coalition against him. His intentions in central Greece were now even more suspect. It was imperative then that Philip act in concert with and as a representative of the Amphictyonic League's wishes and allay Greek suspicions. After some initial discussions with the Thessalians and Boethians, which probably revealed the depth of, allies, of the Allies' disagreement, Philip, quote, determined the, to summon a meeting of the delegates of the Amphictyonic Council and to entrust on, to this body the resolution of the whole issue of the Phokian League, of the Phokian Peace. Welcome in, welcome in, D. Always lovely to see you all. You, you cozy, cozy. It's it's. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope uh, I hope you're relaxed and having a having a nice start to the week. Philip's main problem was restraining the Allies' desire for revenge. Thessaly's hatred for Phocus had its roots in the ancient past, and the Boethians wanted reparations, territory, and revenge for the damage that the war had caused in Boethia. What had, been, what had begun as a minor slight over Phocus's refusal to send troops and support Thebes in Mantinea had embroiled the Thebes in a decade-long war. Thebes wanted to recover its considerable costs at Phocian expense. At some point in the discussions, the Boethi Oetians, a Thessalian people living on the border with Phocus, demanded that the entire adult Phocian male population be regarded as temple ro robbers and suffered a traditional punishment for sacrilege. That is, they wanted them thrown off the, off the Phaedria Day cliffs at Delphi. Cozy work lurking. Ah, nice, nice tea. I hope, uh, I hope work is easy today, or at least not as, not as busy as usual. Uh, enjoy, enjoy your your audio book. The Boethians, somewhat less harshly, suggested that the Phokian populations of the captured Boethian cities be andra, andrapodized or enslaved, where they were taken or sold abroad as slaves. Philip had his hands full with dealing with the allies, with his allies. For it was not in Macedonia's long-term interest that Focus be destroyed. <gasps> Welcome in, Kawhi, and also enjoy your your work, Lurk. Ah, uh, I hope your your new job is going well. Yet you have to head to sleep. No worries, last lot. I also have work in the morning, but ah, uh, thankfully it's at home. So, but uh, have fun, uh, have sweet dreams, and all that. Thank you for joining. Good morning, sir, sir. <laughs> good morning, Kwai. Or, well, good night for me, but good morning. Thank you for joining us. New work starts March 19th. I see, I see, I see. So are you just, are you just enjoying time off? Are you just enjoying the time off? Or are you kind of working? Um, are you working in something else at the moment? Much appreciated. Enjoy the stream. We will. We will. Getting tired to copyright. Well, I hope. Uh, I hope you can chill out. Chill out and uh, feel nice and cozy. Still working. Ah. Oh. Well, at least you're getting paid. Unlike Haru, for the most part. <laughs> As, no, 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 no. I pay her like slightly below minimum wage. But she's going to get a bonus, so it'll bring her bring her up to about minimum wage. <laughs> no, um, but uh, I hope you're looking forward to starting your new work. The Amphictyonic League met in July and pronounced a harsh fate upon the Phokians, but it would have been much worse without Philip's calls for moderation. 
It seemed to many that in reaching a separate peace and alliance with Athens, Philip had cast his lot with the Athenians at the expense of Thebes. Now Thebes had to be prevented from becoming a threat to Macedonian aspirations. Destroying Phocis would have, would have increased Theban influence in central Greece, and removed an important geographic buffer between Macedonian power in Thessaly on the one hand, and Thebes and the Boethian League on the other. Moreover, Theban gains in Phocis would inevitably increase its influence in Boethia. Still, while Philip's own religious sentiments required that Phocis be punished for its grave sacrilege, at the same time his considerations of Macedonian national interest demanded that its existence be ensured. That is, the Allies still meted out a harsh peace. The, Amphicti <clears throat> the Amphictyonic League's delegates resolved to destroy all the Phocian cities, and Pausanias names twenty cities that suffered this cruel fate. Only a bay with its oracle at Apollo was spared because of its previous op opposition to the Delphi sacrilege. Three Boethian cities that the Phocians held at the end of the war, Orchomenus, uh, Corone, and Corosae, had their walls pulled down and were returned to their rightful owners. The League left the treatment of their defenseless populations to the Boethians, however, who promptly enslaved them and sold them off abroad. The Thessalians enslaved and deported the population of Hollis at the same time. The buildings of the Phocian cities were destroyed and the population split up into villages which should be separated from one another by not less than one stray stayed, and each of which would contain no more than fifty houses. The Phocians were denied the use of horses and weapons until such a time as they paid back to the god the money which had been embezzled. However, the Phocians were, quote, to possess their land and to pay every year to the god an indemnity of sixty talents until they had repaid the amount which had been entered in the inventories at the time of the sacrilege. These Phocians, who had fled into exile and were implicated in the sacrilege, were declared accursed and liable to seizure wherever they were found. Presumably, they could then be executed by being thrown from the cliffs at Delphi. Harsh as it was, Phocus was not subject to the wholesale extermination or enslavement of its population that at times had followed other states' defeat. Phocus was at least allowed to live. The armed forces of Macedonia, Thessaly, and Boethia carried out the Amphictyonic League's decisions, but they were apparently under Macedonian command. Philip was the obvious choice to direct the troops' actions since he had commanded the League's troops in the campaign. Any Phocian town that refused to surrender was attacked and destroyed. Macedonian troops played the largest role in implementing the League's decisions, permitting Philip to diminish the severity which its dictates were carried out, while still claiming that he was faithfully fulfilling the League's orders. Thus, the fine of sixty talents was not implemented until 343 BC, and in 341 BC it was reduced to thirty talents at Philip's suggestion. Within two years, Philip began to call for rebuilding some of the Phocian cities, and by 339 BC, the country's capital, Ilatiae, was being rebuilt. Philip was taking pains to ingratiate himself with the Phocian population. Theban troops were not mentioned in any of Philip's efforts to execute the League's dictates, and Philip likely tried to minimize their participation. Philip knew of the Theban desire for a dominant role in Phocis, and worked to block its influence where he could. Although Philip, Philip returned to trees, the three cities the Phocians had captured at Thebes, he did not put the Thebans in charge of Phocis as the Athenians feared he would. It was, the, it was said that Philip wanted Thebes to be Boethian, and not Boethia to be Theban. Thebes must have recognized that it had gained little for its long war with Phocis which had cost it considerably in men and treasure. Thebes found itself caught between Philip and his new ally, Athens, and the Macedonian army was now on the Boethian, Boethian border, capable of striking directly at Thebes, should Philip wish to do so. So Bo Boethia is kind of the region that Thebes occupies. It's kind of a part of, if you guys are wondering exactly what that was. And then there's other, other uh, Greek city-states and kind of groups in that area. The League decreed that Philip and his descendants would be members of the League and should have two should have the two votes which had formerly belonged to the Phocians. 
Combined with the six Thessalian votes that he controlled as Archon of Thessaly, Philip now had a virtual majority over the League's decisions. The votes awarded to Philip were awarded to him personally, so he now became a member of the League in his own right. The Phokians were stripped of their seats, seats as punishment and had no share in the shrine of the Amphictyonic Council. For supporting the Phokians, Sparta was also expelled from the League. Athens, however, was not expelled even though it, has, it was as much an ally to the sacrilegious Phokians as Sparta had been. The only punishment imposed on Athens was the loss of its right of precedence, or promantiae, in consulting the oracle at Delphi. A privilege now awarded to Philip. Philip's lenient treatment of Athens could only deepen Theban resentment that it had been poorly rewarded for its part in the sacred war. Moreover, Philip's preeminent position in the League came a Theban expense, for it had been Thebes that persuaded the League to declare the sacred war in the first place. Theban distrust of Philip grew more ominous. Philip took great pains, however, to always appear to be operating within the context of the League, and not as the king of Macedonia. That is, furthering the alliance's interests first, and not those of his own country. In his negotiations with League members, he dealt generously with everyone. To calm Theban fears, Philip pulled his own Macedonian garrison out of important fortress towns of Nicaea, which controlled the road to Tomopoli, and replaced, and replaced it with a garrison from Thessaly. Philip was also elected president of the Pythian Games, which had not been celebrated for the last twelve years because of the war. Along with the Boethians and the Thessalians, he was to organize a music and athletic festival as an offering of gratitude to Zeus for the liberation of Apollo's shrine. It was ironic that the Greeks chose this barbarian king to become a member of the Amphictyons, the most august of Greek institutions, and to preside over the Greek Olympic Games. But Philip was still Philip, and, quote, he had not only made a name for himself for his piety and talented generalship, but had also built a sure foundation for the future increase of his power. Athens Because of an because of his important role in ending the Sacred War, Philip was in inexorably involved in the great, pow great power politics of Greece. The political and economic isolation from Greek affairs that had attended much of Greek Macedonian history was now a thing of the past. Macedonian policy had once sought to protect the country from invasion by the major Greek states of Athens, Thebans and Sparta. To this end, Philip had become the champion of the sacred war in order to balance Athenian power with Theban power. Athens was by far the greater of the threats to Macedonia, insofar as, as its powerful navy could project force against Macedonian interests in Thrace and the Termaic Gulf. Containing and eroding Athenian power was central to Philip's strategy. On the one hand, his alliance with Thebes in the sacred war had forced Athens to keep substantial ground and naval forces in Attica, to counter a possible Theban attack. Uh, similar to Thebes and Boethia being the region that it's in, uh, Attica is kind of the region that uh, Athens controls. Sparta's alliance with Athens, on the other hand, forced Thebes to deploy substantial military resources to protect against a possible Spartan attack. It was a classic balance of power politics, and Philip proved himself a master at the game. By the time Philip proposed an alliance and a truce as early as 348 BC, Athens was already on its last legs. For the previous century, Athenian power had been built on its control or predominant influence in four areas. Its alliance with the cities of Euboe, Euboe provided an important geographic buffer to invasion by making it impossible for Thebes or Macedonia to use the island as a strategic platform to attack Attica. I might, uh, I might from here pull up some images. That's a Thrace. That's not going to be very helpful to us. Uh, this one seems decent enough. There might be a slightly better one. Here we are. This is a good one. Uh, this is just to kind of explain. So you have, you have, uh... Oh, that's not what I wanted to move. I wanted to move the point. I might make that just slightly bigger. 
There we go. So Euboea, the island that it's talking about, is here, and you can see how close it is to Athica. The only, I believe, the only uh, uh, bridge from Euboea and Attica, central Greece, is this region. You see Thebes and the rest of of uh, Boethia here, Attica and Athens, the Peloponnese with uh, Lyconia and Sparta in this region. They used to control this whole region, but uh, the thir the decades Peloponnesian War kind of put an end to that. Even though they technically won it, uh, they ended up getting beaten by Thebes as Thebes rose to power. Second, Athenian control of the Thermopylae Pass, often in alliance with, uh, with others, was vital to preventing any hostile power to the north, Macedonia and Thessaly in particular, from invading central Greece as a prelude to an attack on Athens itself. Third, the Athenian alliance with the cities of Chals Chalcidides and the pro-Athenian cities and naval bases in the Termaic Gulf allowed Athens allowed Athens to protect its vital resources and strategic materials, timber, silver, gold, and iron, and economic markets in the northern Aegean. The Athenian <laughs> Onisan Haru, is that your Onisan? Kwai? Kwai? Haru is here. She's crying out for her Onisan. <laughs> The Athenian presence at the head of the Termaic Gulf also permitted Athens to defend its interests in Thrace from ground attack by cutting off the land route to the region. Finally, Athenian power depended heavily on its control of the Chironese and the coast of eastern Thrace, so that an enemy could not close off the sea route the Athenian grain fleet sailed to reach the Black Sea ports and their vital supplies of grain. Oh no, oh no, Haru. Haru, I'm sure, I'm sure, Kwai, I'm sure your own Nissan will be here soon. Don't cry, don't cry. By the end of the Sacred War, Philip had weakened the Athenian hold on Euboea, Euboe, driven the Chalcid Chalcidides and the Thermaic Gulf, seized and occupied the Thermopylae Pass, and reduced must much of Thrace to, to a Macedonian satellite, from which he was able to attack eastern Thrace and the Chironese. It was precisely Philip's success in reducing Athenian national power that compelled him to seek an alliance with Athens. Athenian power had been so su successfully reduced that Athens could no longer serve as an effective check on Thebes and Sparta. Having allied Athens with Macedonia, Philip now aimed to reduce Theban and Sparta power, Spartan power in the central Greece region. Sparta had lost its leading position in the Peloponnese, Peloponnesian affairs when it, expe when it was expelled from the Amphictyonic Council. Philip soon began to support pro-Macedonian factions in the city-states of the Peloponnese to weaken Spartan influence even further. Bro drank water before I can even type drown check. <laughs> well, it's right there. If I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. Demosthenes says that by 344 BC... Philip was providing Argos, the ancestral home of the Temenid dynasty of which Philip was a direct descendant, and Messenia, with both money and mercenaries. Philip also re-established a diplomatic contact with the Arcadians, who, quote, set up a statue of Philip in bronze and crowning it with garlands and, to cap it all, they have passed a decree to welcome him in their cities if he should come into Peloponnese, and the Argives are doing just the same. Philip supported a bloody but successful uprising among the Eleans, who then concluded an alliance with him. 
Within three years, 343 BC, Philip had so successfully eroded Spartan control of the Peloponnesian states by political means that the only states in the region that remained allied with Sparta and were not on friendly terms with Philip were Archaea and Corinth. As a consequence, Spartan's ability to interfere with Philip was greatly reduced. So Corinth, Corinth is actually quite an interesting point. Corinth uh, basically is a city and controls kind of an, a, a similar pass as Thermopylae. Not, not similar completely, but one of the main passes that allows the Peloponnese and Attica to be crossed in the first place. So having these guys... During the Peloponnesian War, there was often fights in this region to occupy the forts around here. But it seems that originally, even though Sparta was weakened, they still had major control of of the of this region. Now Philip has desecrated it. Go drown, y'all. Not literally. I think I might in I might have a bath for the first time in a long, long time. Uh next week. I, I feel I, I just kind of want one. I don't know why. I, w I want to just. I think what I what it is is I want to have a way to relax my muscles completely. I just want to like sink into like a nice nice warm bath and just kind of go. <sighs> and like have a big proper long sigh. <laughs> Sim some similar efforts. Uh, at domestic subversion may have gone on in Boethia, where Philip, as he did elsewhere in Greece, had hundreds of guest friends in whom he had invested over the years and who could now be used to good effect. When civil strife broke out in Megara, on the Boethian border, Philip supported the oligarchs with money and mercenaries, increasing the already substantial resentment the Boethians felt over having not gained territory for their efforts in the sacred war, while watching Philip award Thermopylae to the Thessalians. There is no doubt that the Thebans, too, were growing more suspicious of Philip by the day. When civil strife broke out in Euboea in 345 BC, the rival city-states called for help from Philip and Athens, but not from Boethia or Thebes, forcing Thebes to suffer directly the loss of its national prestige. Nor could it have escaped Thebans' attention when Philip argued for a reduction of the punitive fine that the Amphictyonic Council had imposed on the Phocians, or when he had supported a rebuilding of some Phocian cities, most noticeably El Elite. Focus lay between Thessaly and Boethia, an important geographical buffer, geographic buffer as long as the Phocian power remained reduced. But with Philip already occupying most of the Thermopylae fortress towns, the possibility of even a moderately rebuilt focus friendly to Philip represented a military threat to Boethian and Theban security. I haven't bathed in years. I do shower. I shower every day. <laughs> I was about to say how I was going to I was going to call you out. I was going to call you stinky, but it sounds like it sounds like you you're clean, you're clean. You you regularly regularly shower. I'm very much the same. I'm very much the same. I I shower all the time. Usually usually it's at least once a day in the morning and then uh or maybe the night before or it's uh twice a day you know shower that kind of morning shower and then maybe after the gym <laughs> minds and nights of good sleep i do i do really enjoy i do really enjoy uh a nice <laughs> oh no a nice night shower hello danos or daneos <laughs> thank you so 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 much daneos I hope you uh a unique stream. Well I I try. There there is another another streamer like me. Uh his name is Sun Albionis. He does he does readings of uh, of philosophy. <coughs> and I would I would highly recommend recommend checking him out. Uh he he's often reading like Plato or Aristotle. Uh, well mainly Plato, I believe, at the moment. Uh, I want to do similar at some point. I'd love to read maybe the Republic or maybe some some short excerpts from the Republic and kind of deal with, you know, specific areas and kind of explain the background 
philosophy behind them, or at least as I understand it, and some of the some of the things that I've read or watched about it, and listened to lectures. I think that could be quite an interesting stream. Rather than reading the books themselves, taking individual points or maybe stories, like, you know, a whole stream, maybe discussing the Ring of Gaijis or uh, the, the, the ship captain. Oh, what, what is it? The ship of democracy? I can't remember exactly what the term is, but it's, a, it's another thought experiment in the Republic or maybe the cave. The analogy of the cave, every, everyone, many people would be familiar with that one, at least uh, tangentially. Uh, and then, of course, his 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 broad theory of forms, and the kind of deeper, maybe the more the more esoteric, the more esoteric readings behind it, I think, could be a very interesting topic to discuss. And that's more getting into Neoplatonism. Uh, but, but back to uh, our reading. It was in 346 BC that Philip may have begun contemplating an invasion of Persia. Diodorus tells us that after he had arranged the Amphictyonic Council peace, Philip returned to Pella, where, quote, he was eager to be nominated commander-in-chief of the Greeks with full powers and to conduct the war with the Persians. Long a supporter of a Greek-Persian war as a means of uniting Greece and reducing its civil wars, Isocrates had urged Philip in his treatise to Philip, in 346 BC, it was uh, that treatise was literally called to Philip. In 346 BC, to contemplate such an undertaking, a year later, in his first epistle to Philip, Isocrates again urged Philip to action. This time, unbraiding him for for risking his life, or upbraiding him for risking his life and being seriously wounded in a battle with the Illyrians. Just before his death in 338 BC, in his second epistle to Philip, Isocrates reported that friends had asked whether he had put the idea of waging a Persian war in Philip's head, or if Philip had put the idea himself, had had the idea himself. Isocrates suggested that Philip had already thought about invading Pers Persia, and that Isocrates' pleas had merely encouraged Philip to contemplate it seriously. Do you think that Philip was ultimately taken out by the Persians in an attempt to halt his upcoming invasion of Persia? I I think that that's probably the more likely scenario. I know that I I vaguely remember a couple of versions. Some say that it was a spurned, a possible spurned lover, or at least a noble. Others, it was Olympias that she was behind it to give her son the throne. I feel like it's it's more likely... I just feel like of, of all the people who would do it, the Persians seem seem like the, the stronger case. But I do believe this book actually deals with it at the very end, kind of discussing a little bit about the possible suspects. So I certainly would say that it's probably one of the more stronger ones. But it's not like Philip didn't have enemies all over. Uh, he just happened to beat all of them up for the most part but it's not inconceivable it's anyone may have wanted to to kill him a any one of the powerful individuals anyway that he may have may have angered he was the most powerful man in greece i think they were afraid of him by taking him out with the naive co native collaborators being old and pious or whoever they unknowingly doom themselves by the ascent of Alexander, <laughs> which I do think I do think then there's a little bit of a, a poetic, poetic irony in there. Wait, is that the right term? I think it is poetic irony, uh, in that in that action. If it was the Persians, exactly that. That uh, it may very well have been that if they hadn't killed them, they may have only just lost a portion of their empire. Uh, unfortunately for them, Alexander was a little bit more ambitious. The case for Philip having considered an invasion of Persia at this early date is not overly persuasive. It is based on the fact that Philip did not attack Athens after he seized Thermopylae, but had honoured his allegiance with Athens instead. Once beyond the Thermopylae gates, Philip had asked his, n his new ally to send troops to assist him. 
Athens had refused, providing Philip with an excuse to attack Athens if he had wished. Moreover, Philip had st was still allied with Boethia, Thebes, Thessaly, and most of its cities, including Pharsalus, Phare, and Pagasae. In the east, Byzantium, Perinthus, and the king Amadocus of Thrace were Philip's allies. Philip's armies could have easily cut, um, uh, cut Athenian defenses and taken its remaining possessions in Thrace and the Chironese. Thus, some argue that Philip did not attack Athens when he could have done, because he wanted to use his navy during a paid Persian invasion, implying, of course, that he was already contemplating invasion Persia. Invading Persia. Philip may well have had the idea in mind, but the primary reason he did not attack Athens was that he needed Athens as a check against Theban and Spartan influence to maintain the balance of power in central Greece, and not because he needed the Athenian navy to invade Persia. Assuming Philip considered undertaking a, Philip, a Persian war, it could not have been more than a vague idea in his mind in 346 BC, and certainly not a premise upon which to base Macedonian strategy in the near future. A good general, Philip must have re recognized that the conditions for waging a successful invasion were nowhere on the political horizon. First, an invasion of Persia would have to be launched from eastern Thrace, with Sertoblites, which Sertoblites still held with Athenian help. Athens itself continued to control the Chironese and the Hellespont, and Philip understood that a major military campaign would be required to force Sertoblites to terms. Second, Philip needed the Athenian navy not so much for transports, which were readily available for hire, but for its naval combatants to protect the invasion force against the Persian fleet during the Kuros. Once accomplished, Philip would need the Athenian navy to remain at sea, bottling up the Persian navies in its Phoenician and Ionian ports, and preventing a Persian seaborne attack on Greece itself. The problem was that Athens was unconvinced that its true interest lay in an alliance with Philip. When news reached the city that Philip had returned, had captured a Thermopylae Pass, the population was thrown into a panic. The assembly voted to evacuate the city to take up positions in the countryside and to man the fortifications in the city's defenses. Philip was outraged at the Athenians' behavior and sent a letter promising that their actions was hardly consistent with those of a true ally. Nonetheless, Athens continued to regard Philip with suspicion, urged on by an anti-Macedonian faction led by Dem Demosthenes, who sought every means to oppose Philip and to increase Athenian influence at Philip's expense. In 346 BC, it was unclear whether Athens would cooperate with Philip in anything, much less allow its navy to support an invasion of Persia. Third, Philip could not could dare to take the Macedonian army out of Greece and into Persia only if he were absolutely certain that the major Greek states would not attack Macedonia while he was away. But in 346 BC, while Philip was busy undermining Thebes, Boethia, and Sparta, his efforts did not go unnoticed and increasing these states' suspicions regarding Philip's intentions. The day might come when these states could be trusted, but that day was still quite distant. Philip could have been could have given only passing consideration to the idea of an attack on Persia in 346 BC. It is interesting that Athens remained consistently opposed to Philip's apparent genuine desire to reach an accommodation with it. If Philip's strategy to reduce Theban power was to su succeed, then Athenian power and influence in central Greece had to increase in order to serve as an effective check on Thebes. To this end, we might surmise that Philip was genuinely interested in making Athens the dominant power in Greece with his cooperation and military support. I know that even after, uh, even after Alexander left, I believe was it, was it Parmenio? I think it might have been Parmenio that uh, uh, Alexander left in in Greece in Macedonia, and he, I'm quite sure Parmenio had to deal with many many revolts from uh, from all over the uh, Macedonian and Greece kind of regions. Athens mistakenly, mistakenly saw Philip's ambitions as taking control of all Greece, while itself playing a subordinate role. The issue swings, of course, on whether in 346 BC Philip was indeed trying to bring about the conditions necessary for an invasion of Persia. 
It could be argued that Philip was looking to the long term, that an invasion of Persia was what he wanted. Control of Greece, after all, had little to offer Philip. Most of the Greek cities were small, poor, and barely able to feed themselves. Macedonia would derive little wealth and perhaps significant expense from their conquest. Control of Greece south of Thessaly was of no strategic use except to prevent the larger states from combining against Philip during his absence in Persia. If Philip was seeking glory and wealth, then an invasion of Persia made the most sense. The Athenians, however, remained unconvinced. No matter how logical the argument for Philip's Persian policy could be made to sound, in the end the Athenian experience with Philip, the vastly different cultures and histories of the two city states. Excuse me. Uh, the vastly different cultures and history of the two states, and the nature of Athenian factional domestic policies, left many with a genuine fear and suspicion of Philip. The opportunity for a lasting peace and alliance between Philip and Athens slipped away. Illyria again. Philip's respite from war and affairs did not last long after his return to Pella. The following spring of 345 BC, Philip took his army into Illyria to deal with the growing threat of rebellion. As noted in Chapter 1, the Dardanians and the Ardea had formed an alliance that forced Philip to move quickly to prevent them from assembling on his borders. Philip's previous defeats of the area's tribes may have encouraged the remaining tribes, particularly the, the Ardea, to move south into the now weakened territories and to encroach on Philip's new security perimeter. Diodorus, however, tells us that the reason for Philip's campaign was, quote, an ancestral enmity with the Illyrians, and he, quote, found the quarrel to be unreconcilable. If Diodorus is correct, then Philip's problem with the Dardani Dardanian king Bardilus, who had invaded Macedonia when Philip was a young man, and with whom the Macedonians had an ancestral quarrel, and with whom the Macedonians had an ancestral quarrel, it is possible, however, that the stimulus from the revolt came not from the Dardanians, but from the Ardea and King uh, Pluratos, who may have been directing events for the tribal confederation. The Ardea occupied the lower valley, valley of the Drin River area, located near the Rhizon Gulf on the Dalmatian coast in northern Albania. Diodorus tells us that Philip invaded Illyria with a large army, from which we can, may conclude that he brought the full strength of the Macedonian army to bear. Philip's previous campaigns in Illyria had taught him the difficulties inherent in fighting against such fierce tribal warriors in terrain that was hostile to an invading army. These circumstances and the size of the tribal armies noted by Theopompus, 300,000 strong, led Philip to ensure his forces would be adequate for the task. We are unclear as to which, which of the thrives, the Dardanians, the Ardea, were, was Philip's primary target. Justin claims that Philip campaigned against Cletus, the son of Bardilus of the Dardanians, but Didymus tells us that Philip fought against uh, Pluratos, king of the Ardea. We are probably not too far wrong if we conclude that Philip attacked Cletus first, and then Pluratos, prohibiting the kings from assembling their forces against Philip. The battle must have been a major engagement. Philip himself was almost killed, but the soldier Pausanias saved the day by covering his body with his own and shielding him from further blows. Philip was badly wounded, along with 150 of his officers. It was in this battle that Philip suffered the broken leg that laid him up for perhaps a year. Philip's victory broke the Illyrian rebellion and, quote, after pillaging the lands and securing many of the townships, he returned to Macedonia with large quantities of booty. It is at this time that Justin, our only source for the incident, says that Philip, quote, capriciously transplanted whole peoples and cities as he felt regions needed to be populated or depopulated. Curiously, Justin says that Philip pursued this strategy after, quote, he returned to his kingdom meaning that he for the forcibly removed populations were Macedonians already living in the country. Undoubtedly, Philip had begun taking measures to develop Macedonia, and some movement of peoples within the country had already occurred. Philip continued this policy throughout his reign, with the result that Macedonia's infrastructure and economy became among the best in Greece. 
I think it unlikely, however, that Justin was speaking about the forced movement of Macedonian populations. The cruelty with which Justin implies the deportations were carried out stands in stark contrast to Philip's usual treatment of his countrymen. Justin notes the despair and the fear of the displaced popula populations. Quote, Everywhere it was a dismal picture, almost of desolation. There was silence, forlorn dejection, as men feared that even their tears might be taken to signify opposition. The evacuees looked wistfully now at the tombs of their forefathers, now at their ancient family deities, now at the house in which they had been born and themselves produced children. That Philip could be cruel is beyond question, as his enslavement of Olinto shows, but his treatment of his own countrymen usually stood in sharp, marked contrast to the manner in which Justin says Philip treated the deported populations. Hello, clever. Welcome in. Welcome in. Hi, Rua. It is possible that Philip was instead describing Philip's deportations and transplantations of the tribes he had just defeated, moving them away from their homelands and mixing them with other people to dilute their tribal identities so that they could not trouble him again. Justin tells us that during this campaign, Philip captured and transplanted to Macedonia more than 10,000 Illyrians named Sarnusi. I'm guessing that's a tribe, not, a, not, not 10,000 10, Illyrians all named Sarnusi. Philip, Philip's campaign of 345 BC was his third in Illyria and the tribal areas in less than a decade. Perhaps Philip decided to put an end to the problem in Illyria once and for all. Justin's description of what happened to the transplants lend itself to the interpretation. Quote, Some of these people settled right on his borders as a bulwark against his enemies. Others he set on the remote frontiers of the empire. Some who were prisoners of war he distributed to supplement the population of his cities. Perhaps some of, these, some of these tribal populations were mixed with Macedonians whom Philip had encouraged to move with grants of land and other inducements, as he was all, had already done in Thrace and Chalcides, Chalcides. If Philip hoped deporting the tribes would solve the Illyrian problem, he was to be disappointed. In 337 BC, Philip was allegedly back in Illyria, at this time campaigning against the tribal king named Pluralus, Plurius. You fell asleep, copyright. What did you miss? Uh, just uh, a bit of discussion on Philip and Athens and whether Philip had, at this point, considered invading Greece if his, uh, if his kind of alliance with Athens was, was genuine and a little bit about some rebellions happening in the Illyrian tribes. But uh, don't worry, feel free to go back to sleep all you want. <sighs> Trouble in Thessaly. While Philip was in Pella, recovering from his fractured lead, leg, sporadic civil wars or civil strife broke out in several Thessalian cities. The cause of this disorder are unclear. Some in the country were disappointed that the Thessaly had only gained Magnesia and Nicaea for its efforts in the Sacred War, but it is unlikely that the turmoil, turmoil was directed at Philip. The violent factional politics of Thessalian cities had frequently led to such conditions in the past. Pagasay's grievances probably were related to having to pay some of its port duties to Philip. Meanwhile, Ferrain seems never to have lost its resentment of Philip for having deposed his previous rulers who were plotting a return. Larissa's rebellion must have taken Philip by surprise, however. The Eluide clan, to whom Philip was related by marriage, still ruled the region. Philip's primary concerns in Thessaly were ma maintaining its stability, preserving his access to its taxes and Jews, and ensuring, above all, the Thessalian cavalry was available when he needed it. Continue your wonderful dream. Enjoy, copyright. Enjoy. It was probably Larissa's issuance of currency in its own name that pushed Philip to put an end to the instability in Thessaly. In the summer of 344 BC, the Macedonian army marched into Thessaly, seized Larissa, removed Simos, the leader of the Eloide, from power. 
Fere was captured next, and his renegade leaders imprisoned or driven from the city. The Macedonian army then continued to quash the disorder in some other cities, although Demosthenes' claim that all of them were occupied can be rejected. It is unclear if Philip himself led the army, or if he put Parmenio or Antipater in command. Sorry, I believe I I think it was Antipater who, who was left behind. Was it Antipater or Parmenio? I think it was Antipater actually who was left behind in Greece, well, to to rule Greece while Alexander went off. I can't remember which. I'm I think it was Antipater. The soldier scholar N. G. L. Hammond, citing Demosthenes, says that Philip led the incursion, while Cockwell believes that Philip was still recovering from his wound and had remained in Pella. In either case, relative tranquility was restored to Thessaly in short order. To prevent any further civil disturbances from getting out of hand, Philip established Macedonian troop garrisons in several cities. In addition, he reorganized the administrative structure of the major cities by placing power in the hands of a ten-board Ten-man board, a didarchy, or a decadarchy, whose members he appointed. As his archon, Philip next strengthened the administrative structure of the Thessalian League, the all-important military alliance of Thessalian cities that provided him with cavalry and money. The League had traditionally been organized into four quarters, or tetrades, or regions whose origins were tribal. But this form of organization had been previously discarded. Philip now reintroduced it. He reinstituted, reinstated each of the four original tribal areas: Thessaliotis, Pelasgiotis, Hestiaotis, and Phthiotis, and in each appointed a military governor, or a tetrarch. A tetrarch. <clears throat> Excuse me, who was uh, answerable only to him. Every tetrarch was placed in command at the troop levi levies and drawn from his area. With these reformed, Philip's control of Thessaly's vital military resources was strengthened, strengthened, but not unduly so. The Thessalians seemed to accept the new order as a necessary price of civic peace, while Philip always treated Thessaly as a free country and not a mere possession of Macedonia. Epirus. Ooh, Epirus. In the early spring of 342 BC, Philip moved against the Molosian ruler, Arbibus, who was the uncle of, of Olympius, Philip's Molosian wife. In 350 BC, Philip had removed Arbibus as king, reduced him to the status of regent for Alexandros, Arbibus's nephew and son of the former king, and thereby established a new line of succession. Alexandros had been sent to Pella, where he was educated and prepared to resume the Molosian throne when he reached the age of majority. Now Philip took an army into Epirus, removed Arbibus, and placed Alexandros on the throne. Diodorus tells us that Arbibus, the king of the Molosians, died after a reign of ten years, leaving a son, uh, Aesides, the father of Pyrrhus. However, he was succeeded by Alexandros, the brother of Olympius, thanks to the involvement of Philip. Diodorus is incorrect, however, in saying that Arbibas died. In fact, Arbibas was an honorary Athenian citizen and fled to Athens, where his citizenship was confirmed. The Athenian generals were instructed to recover Arbibas's throne for him and his children. Hmm. Why did Philip move against Arbibas? Since the peace in 346 BC, the anti-Macedonian faction in Athens had been gaining influence. Delegations were sent to the various Peloponnesian states and elsewhere in Greece, stirring resentment against Philip. Arbibas had attempted to use Athens against Philip once before, after Philip's defeat at the Crocus Field, and this flirtation had cost Arbibas his throne once Philip regained his position. Arbibas was possibly attempting to secure the succession for his son and sought Athenian support for his plan. Philip was aware of the sentiment in Athens and had, may have removed Arbibas to forestall any Athenian military support for the old Molosian king. The southwestern border had always been a problem for Macedonia, and Philip may have hoped to solve the problem once and for all by a installing a loyal vassal king there. 
Philip was always cognizant of, his, of the political context in which he operated, and before invading Epirus he had sent several proposals to Athens to demonstrate his reasonableness and open-mindedness in dealing with the Athenians. Philip proposed that the peace of Philocrates be expanded into a common peace that was open to any Greek state that wished to draw, join. He offered to submit Athenian claims to the Thracian fortresses and the island of Holob Holonesus to arbitration. Finally, Philip proposed a joint expedition to rid the Aegean of piracy and offered to bear all costs associated with it if, Athenian provided the, of Ath if Athens provided the ships and crews. Excuse me. Uh, where were we? Oh yes. Given that Athenian commerce and its weather, uh, wheat supply were vulnerable to a piracy, Athens should have easy, easily accepted the offer. While these prop proposals were being debated in Athens, Philip marched into Epirus and removed Arvivas. Still in the field, Philip decided to strengthen the southern border of Epirus by pushing it to the Am by to the Ambria Kyoto Gulf. I don't know what that means. Um, the Ambria Kyoto Gulf, which the Casopeans then controlled. The Ambracians had trading stations in the peninsula and monopolized the trade from Ar Ambracia and Corinth. Whoa. Okay, so I think it might be like this whole region down here. That's a lot of trading. All along the west coast. Demosthenes tells us that Philip, quote, destroyed by fire the territory of the three city-states in Cassiopeia, Pandosia, Bucheta, Bocetia, and Alatria, colonies of Elis forced his way into the cities and handed them over to his kinsman, Alexander, to be his slaves. This is Alexander, the uh, Melogian, who is the the nephew of Olympius. Oh wait, was it her brother? Uh, no, it was Arivas' nephew. Yeah. The whole operation could not have taken very long, and by early summer, Philip moved south against towards the Corinth Corinthian colonies of Lucas and Ambracia. The chief exporter of embryo to timber and animal products to Corinth, the colonies appealed for military help to Corinth, which in turn appealed to Athens for troops. Philip's decision to move towards Ambracia seems to have been one of the few instances in, when he f in which he failed to consider the political context in which he was operating, and as a result may have been surprised by the reaction he encountered. Athens answered Corinth's claim appeal by sending troops to reinforce Arsania, and Corinth sent troops to reinforce Ambracia. Philip wisely withdrew rather than risk a direct confrontation with Philip with Athens, over a minor border dispute. The event was enough, however, for the Athenian assembly to reject Philip's proposals, and Demosthenes, the leader of the anti-Macedonian faction, increased the delegations visiting Greek states to stir up trouble against Philip. In the summer of 342 BC, Demosthenes himself led a, vi led a delegation visiting Thessaly, Ambracia, the Illyrians, and the king of the Thracians. The Athenian diplomatic efforts against Philip were successful. An Athenian delegation visiting the Peloponnese were, was able to convince Philip's allies of Argos, Messinia, and Megalopolis to enter alliances with Athens. Mantinea and Archaea did likewise. Philip had miscalculated badly, with the result that Athens was able to reduce Macedonian influence in the Peloponnese and convince three of the region's states to break openly with Philip. Wow. That is huge. Philip has been heavily pushed back. The Thracian Campaign 
Since the peace of Philocrates, Athenian responses had been almost entirely negative to Philip's attempts to reach a genuine accord with Athens. They refused Philip's proposal in 344 to expand the peace of Philocrates into a common peace. Philip had hoped that a common peace would bind the Greeks together, leaving him free to campaign in the east. But the Athenians' willingness to check Philip's movements in Ambracia were with force, the rejection of his proposals on piracy and arbitration, and the brazen attempts by the anti-Macedonian factions in Athens to suborn Macedonian influence in the Peloponnese and elsewhere, had finally convinced Philip that a reapproachment with Athens was now impossible. With his southern and northern borders secured against further disruptions by the tribes, the Greek states were still too weak to form a coalition against him, and Athenian interests in the region no long oh an Athenian interests in the region Yeah, let me read that again. With his southern and western borders secured against any further disruptions by the tribes, the Greek states still too weak to form a coalition against him, and Athenian interests in the region no longer of his concern, Philip attacked Thrace in three forty two BC. And uh, I'm going to bring in a, a new map here of Thrace get a new map bros let's go map bros uh, I'm gonna make this nice and kind of big here and I'm gonna widen it a little bit there we go <sighs> so nice having maps and I can just point to things He had good reasons to do so. The treacherous Setablites had once more moved closer to Athens and again accepted its help in expanding his kingdom. Diodorus, who was the only source for Philip's, th uh, Philip's Thracian campaign, says, quote, The king of the Thracians, Setablites, was continually making subject to himself and ravaging the territory of the Greek city-states, which were his neighbours by the Hellespont. Accordingly, because Philip wished to put an end to the assaults by the barbarians, he campaigned against them with large forces. Sertablites and Teres, the king of central Thrace, who had joined him, submitted. Philip could now remove the last vestiges of Athenian influence in the region, threaten their bases in the Cheronees, and block the route the Athenian wheat ships used. Removing Sertablites was a prelude to a major strategic strike at Athens. Let me see how many more pages we have, because I don't think it's many. Oh, it's still still a few. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, I'll try and push to finish the chapter. Just as all Greeks, Philip was acutely aware of Persia and the threat it presented to his ambitions in Thrace. Three times in the last 150 years, Persia had invaded Greece by crossing the Hellespont and moving its armies overland through Thrace. Philip saw his occupation of eastern Thrace as necessary, as necessary to block any future Persian move against him. With Thrace now in his possession, Philip would be able to meet any Persian forces early, and perhaps even prevent their landing. Even if he failed to do so, he could at least confine much of the fighting to Thrace, rather than face it in Macedonia itself. Finally, if the fighting... If Philip was contemplating a future invasion of Philip via Ionia, he would lead that invasion from eastern Thrace, with the region serving as a strategic platform for the attack. The size of Philip's large forces suggests that he intended nothing less than the complete subjugation of all of Thrace. With its, with its three geographic zones, Thrace is a forbidding region in which to wage war. First, the Aegean coastlands run, run from Philippi to Byzantium and are bordered by the sea to the south and the Rod Rodope mountain range to the north, separating the coast from the interior. Philip's previous incursions into the region had been confined to operations in the coastal area, which was the heartland of Sertablites' kingdom. So, uh, let's take a quick look. I, there is Pella. I believe here is Philippi. And uh, it's always talking about this region. Here's the uh, mountain range that was mentioned. 
And I believe you have kind of central Thrace up here, where Setabletes probably controls. Next, beyond the first range of mountains to the north, was the Hebrus River Valley, modern Martiza. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is getting a little at me now. Which ran, ran parallel to the coastal town coast down to the Aegean and led to a region of fertile plains that went north from the Aegean to the Black Sea coast. This agricultural region was the source of the grain shipped to the Athens each spring. Ah, here's the Herbus, Herbaeus River, and this is the region I think that it's saying is very important to the Athenians. The third zone was separated from the fertile plains by the great Balkan mountains, the Hamos Mountains in antiquity, running west to east, almost to the Black Sea coast, and included the valleys running north to the Danube Basin. This area was accessed to the Shipka Pass, some 90 miles north of Philip, Philip's base at Philip, Philippopolis, or Philippopolis, the heartland of the gate of the Gite Kingdom was located some 150, some 150 north of the pass near the headwaters of the Danube. So it's talking about this region up here, the Gite. Passages over the mountains were few and difficult, and much of the region was heavily forested, slowing military movement and affording great risk of ambush. The Balkan winters were notoriously harsh, but some of Philip's campaigns were conducted, was conducted in the winter months. The Thracians were a formidable foe whom the Greeks feared as ferocious warriors. Herodotus says that to live by war and plunder is of all things the most glorious to them, and to till the ground was the most dishonorable. The Thracians are the most powerful people in the world, except of course the Indians, and if they had one ruler, they would be irresistible and by far the strongest of all people, in my belief. The Thracians' weakness was their social structure in which each tribe or clan had its own ruler or king, and nothing in a way of national authority for waging war against an invader. Moreover, the, th the tribes regularly fought one another for their isolated hilltop kingdoms. These circumstances allowed Philip to engage the Thracian tribes piecemeal, usually with numbers being in his favor. favor. Thracian tribal forces were usually a mix of cavalry and infantry, or peltasts. Named for the small shield, pelta, they carried, the peltasts were light infantry skilled in mobility and in using a longer spear than that of the Greek infantry against both infantry and cavalry. By Philip's day, it was not unusual to find peltasts in the armies of the Greek states, although they usually appeared in small numbers. These units brought a modicum of mobility to the battlefield, the Greek heavily the heavy Greek hoplite infantry lacked. The magnitude of Philip's Thracian campaign in 342 to 340 BC should be appreciated. Thrace was an enormous region, comprising seven times the area of Macedonia and the upper cantons from which Philip drew his army. The population was at least five times greater than that of Macedonia, and the canton and the cantons. Thrace's difficult terrain, mountains, thick forests, and swift running streams, and terribly harsh river winter climate worked against the invader. Philip's army, as usual, configured with heavy pikemen and cavalry, would have been at a disadvantage against the more mobile tribal forces that knew the terrain well. Drawing upon his allies and subjects, however, Philip could reconfigure his forces to the operational environment. Referring to Philip's armies in Thrace in 340 BC, Demosthenes tells us that, quote, You hear of Philip marching wherever he wishes, not by leading a phalanx of heavy infantry, but by a being equipped with light infantry, cavalry archers, mercenaries, and such soldier soldierly. The mercenaries included Cretan archers, tradi traditional Greek hoplites for hire, and some Greek light cavalry. From his allies and subjects, Philip drew Thessalian cavalry, light infantry from Thessaly, 
the mountain tribes of central Greece, javelin men from Illyria. Both the terrain and configuration of enemy forces required that Philip be able to tailor his forces to the tactical circumstances he was facing. The addition of new, more flexible units gave the traditional phalanx and Macedonian heavy, heavy cavalry that, co that constituted the bulk of Philip's expeditionary force the tactical, tactical flexibility he required. In July 342 BC, Philip's army marched out of Pella, crossed the Strymon River, turned north along the borders of the Medi, and then headed northeast to, the, to Philippopolis, where the army rested before beginning the com combat phase of the campaign. So, uh, Philippopolis, I believe, is... Uh, there's Pella. There's Philippi. I can sworn if Philippopolis is somewhere... Ah, here it is. So they're already kind of deep into, uh... In the Thrace already. <clears throat> At Philippopolis, Philip built a fort to serve as his army's main operational and logistics base. From there, Philip could take two different routes. He could go down the head... Hebrus River, strike into Odrysse, modern Edrine, Sertablites stronghold, and then go on the Aegean coast, a march of some 160 miles. Alternatively, alternatively from Philippopolis, Philip could march a due north 40 miles to the Shipka Pass, leading through the Great Balkan Mountains and the Bosch of the Danubian Plain in the land of the Gite, a march of 110 miles. Philip marched down the Herbus River, attacking and defeating the forces of the allies of Terry and Sertablites in several battles as he went. Ten months later, in April 341 BC, Philip had, sub had subdued the area from the Herbus River, or the Hebrus River, to the Black Sea coast. Wow. In a speech delivered in the spring of 341 BC, Demosthenes says that as a result of Philip's winter campaign, Philip had destroyed and reorganized the cities of Drongylus, uh, Kabyle and Mastyrie, indicating that Sertablites and Teres had been driven, driven from their kingdoms. Philip's armies roamed at will the great plain between Byzantium and Odysseus. Odysseus, a Greek city on the Black Sea coast and a number of Greek cities in the area made alliances with him. During the year that followed, Diodorus tells us that Philip founded significant cities in advantageous, in brackets, strategic localities. Diodorus probably means that Philip built forts and points of military control rather than cities per se. Athens must have been greatly concerned that Philip's army now had access to the Great Plain and the sources of much of Athens' imported grain, and that he was forging alliances with those cities that made their living shipping that grain to Athens. Philip was in an excellent strategic position to cut off the food supply to Athens. One of these Greek cities was Odysseus, on the coast of the Black Sea, about a hundred miles north of Byzantium. Uh, just over here, Odysseus. This uh, this becomes a big hassle for uh, for one of the successor kings, I'm quite sure, this region. When the tribes kind of take over that region and just really annoy him. As Philip approached the city with his army, he discovered that it was occupied by a garrison of Gite, a semi-nomadic people who lived between the Great Balkan Range and the Danube River. River. What they were doing there is unknown, but their presence indicates that the king of the Gite, Cotylus, controlled the area of the southern bank of the Danube from the middle of the Great Balkan Range and east to the sea. Theopompus records that as Philip was preparing to assault the city, the gates opened and the white-robed Getic priests played li playing lyres and singing prayers marched out towards the Macedonians. The priests wanted peace and offered to negotiate a truce. A treaty was quickly concluded. The inhabitants of Odysseus, of Odysseus welcomed Philip as a liberator. Philip seemed to have marched into the Getic heartland shortly thereafter. Marching north from Odysseus, Philip 
paths across the Thracian lowlands between the easternmost foothills of the Great Balkan Range and the sea before turning inland and reaching the Geta Kingdom that lay between the Shipka Pass and the Danube, some 140 miles from Odysseus. There Philip made an alliance with Cotylus, who offered his daughter, Maida, to be Philip's wife to seal the alliance. Philip took Maida as his wife, his sixth marriage after a gap of ten years. Philip's alliance with the Gitae secured the loyalty of the only major population left in the Thrace that had the means to oppose Philip, or to join with Athens against him. Philip had already enlisted some of the coastal cities, including Perinthus and Byzantium as allies, and many of the city-states from the Sea of Marmara up to the coast of the Black Sea were under Philip's influence. Philip returned to Philippopolis through the Shipka Pass and posted a Macedonian garrison there to control its access. By the summer of 341 BC, Teres and Sertablites had formally surrendered, and Philip controlled Thrace from the Great Balkan Range in the north to the Aegean Sea in the south, and from the Nessus River east to the Black Sea. He had concluded alliances with most of the independent tribes, which agreed to provide soldiers for Philip's armies. He began to conduct a number of military construct a number of military towns and strong points to fortify the approaches from Thrace to Macedonia. He constructed the towns of Drangailos, Kabyle, and Mysterie to control the eastern approaches through the vital he Hebrus Valley and Baro, and Philippopolis at the west end of the valley commanded the southern approaches to the Shipka Pass. Philip imposed a 10% tax on all agricultural produce coming from central and eastern Thrace. No tax was imposed on western Thrace, which in any case had been incorporated into the Macedonian national state. To administer the region, Philip appointed a military governor with the title General of Thrace. The region's mines were open for exploitation, and Thracians were allowed to serve in the Macedonian army. Recruiting Thracian troops into the army was important since Philip needed a tactical capability that the Thracian peltasts, archers, slingers, and other light infantry could provide to, make control of the, to maintain control of the region and to participate in a possible campaign against Persia. Philip's activities in Thrace must have depleted Macedonian military manpower to some degree. Early in 340 BC, Philip ordered Antipater, whom he had entrusted with the governance of Macedonia in 342 BC, when the Thracian campaign began, to join him with additional forces. Philip's son Alexander, now 16 years old, was appointed regent in Antipater's place. Philip used a speciality Philip's use of speciality military units drawn from the various tribes and peoples of the empire created the multi-ethnic army that established Macedonian supremacy in Eastern Europe and that Alexander later took with him into Asia. Last page. With Philip, while Philip was busy in Thrace, events in Greece had taken an interesting turn. Almost immediately after Philip left for Thrace, civil war broke out once again between the pro-Macedonian and pro-Athenian factions on the island of Euboea. Macedonia and Athens both sent generals and mercenaries to support their respective clients. Callias, the leader of the important city of Calchas, had been an ally of Philip's, but, in, but by early 341 BC he had switched sides and returned for Athens' support for the creation of an independent Euboean confederacy under Calchas's leadership. That summer, Athens provided Cal Callias, or Callias with ships that he used to attack Macedonian cities on the coast of the Gulf of Pagasae. As allies of Philip's, Philip's, these cities fell under the protection of the peace of Philocrates. Athenian complicity in the raids, the Athenian assembly publicly tanked Callias for his efforts and made him an Athenian city, citizen, constituted an act of war against Philip. Meanwhile, to counter Philip's activities in Thrace, Athens strengthened, it, strengthened this position of the Chironese by sending both more settlers, or clerics, to the area, and a general in command of ships and a force of mercenaries. Athens also attempted to insert a group of its colonists in the city of Cardia. The expedition's commander, the Athenian mercenary captain, Diopithes of, S of Sinium, raised the money to pay his troops by demanding protection money from merchant ships, engaging in piracy against merchantmen bound for Macedonia, and ravaging the land around Cardia, and holding its citizens for ran ransom. 
Diopethes had attacked Carabyle and Therostasis and carried off hostages. All three cities were, were allies of Philip's. When Philip sent an envoy, Amphiphylochus, to petition for the relief of the captured civilians, Diopethes tortured him and demanded ransom for his relief as well. After he also threatened to attack Cardia, Philip sent a Macedonian garrison to protect the city. Diopethes' actions against Philip's allies constituted another case, Causus Belli, under the th terms of the Peace of Philocrates. Since Philip took no military action, instead, still Philip took no military action. Instead, he sent letters to the Athenian assembly, asking to it to recall Diopethes and punish him. Demosthenes and the anti-Macedonian faction convinced the assembly to refuse Philip's request, however, and to send reinforcements and a fleet of 40 ships under General Chares' command to aid Diopethes. To further insult Philip, Demosthenes and Callias undertook a tour of the Peloponnese that autumn and winter to encourage the states there to join the general alliance against Philip. All of these actions were technically acts of war under the peace. Still, Philip did nothing. Persia made Philip cautious. Persia had been distracted by internal problems for most of Philip's reign. By 340 BC, however, Persia had succeeded in establishing control over Egypt, Cyprus, and Phoenicia, and remained, or Phoenica, and remained on good terms, Phoenicia, yeah, Phoenicia, and remained on good terms with the Greek cities in coastal Asia gaining access to their fleets. Philip knew that, for all its bluster, Athens was making little progress in attracting other Greek states to its anti-Macedonian cause, and that alone Athens was in no position to fight a war against Philip. Philip's most important strategic concern was that Philip's would seek an alliance with a resurgent Persia, and their combined naval forces could seriously threaten Philip's hold on Thrace. Philip had anticipated such a possibility, in the summer of 342, before embarking on the Thracian campaign, Philip and the Persians had signed a non-aggression pact in Pella, in which Philip promised not to intervene in Asia, and Artaxerxes, and the Persian king agreed not to cross into Thrace or interfere with Philip at sea. When an Athenian delegation arrived in Susa in early summer 340 BC, seeking a defensive alliance against Philip, the Persian king declined the offer and sent them packing with financial gifts. The failure of the Athenian delegation to secure Persian aid removed the last restraint on Philip. That summer, Philip prepared for war with Athens. And that's uh, where I will leave that, this reading for today. A little bit over what I was intending, but uh, a nice, a nice uh, more chunk of the, of the book done. And next chapter will, of course, deal with this, this war with Athens. A lot of, a lot of uh, areas dealt with there over the last kind of couple of years of Philip's life. Oh my God, I need to. I need to go have a, a sip of water, I think. Or not water, a cup of tea. And uh, maybe even a little bit of honey for my, for my throat. It's a little bit, a little bit sore. Not sore, but, you know, strained just a tiny bit. My bitrate has been unstable this whole stream, but it's saying that it's at like 6,000 kilobytes. I don't know. It's being, it's being silly. But uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining me today, whether you're listening live or as a VOD, just to, just to follow along the story. Thank you for joining. Uh, I think I'm going to head off straight away, so... And grab me the market and slong the